All right, so welcome everyone to the How to Puzzle Hunt presentation. Uh, today we're just going to be going over some tips and tricks to getting started in your very first puzzle hunt, introducing some key concepts, that kind of thing. And uh, we are looking to make it a little bit interactive. So if anyone has any questions or observations or comments during this, uh, feel free to either uh, jump in on the VC or to send a message in this uh, Games and Puzzles VC channel. I have it open on my phone, so I will be watching along. So first and foremost, what is a puzzle hunt? Uh, well, these are very often two to seven day long live events in which teams compete to be the first to solve a set of puzzles. There are a variety of puzzle hunts throughout the year. Um, and the big one is the MIT Mystery Hunt, which takes place in January over Martin Luther King uh, weekend every single year. There's usually close to a thousand teams that participate in that. Um, and the puzzles are insanely difficult. So that is what we're kind of working up to. But there are smaller ones throughout the year as well that are easier, more beginner friendly, that kind of thing. They are usually divided into rounds. Each round includes a number of puzzles that we refer to as feeder puzzles. And the end of the round is a meta puzzle. And we're gonna dive into what those mean in the future slides. Uh, usually you start the hunt with only one or two feeder puzzles unlocked. And as you solve them, uh, you unlock more feeder puzzles. And when you solve a certain number of feeder puzzles, you'll unlock the meta, and when you solve the meta, you will progress to the next round of the hunt. So that's kind of the basic structure that we are looking at. The hunt ends when you solve the final meta, so you don't actually have to solve every single puzzle in a hunt, uh, just enough puzzles to unlock and solve the final meta. And at that point, you lock in your team's position on the leaderboard. Uh, in these smaller hunts, Usually our goal is just to finish in the first place. Uh, in the last hunt we did, we finished about in the top 25% of teams, which was really exciting. Um, but yeah, that's the basic goal, is to get through and solve the final meta. So to start out, what is a feeder puzzle? Well, usually these are standalone puzzles. They are presented without any kind of explicit instructions. And the goal of the puzzle is to find a common word or phrase that will act as your final answer. Uh, the structure of a puzzle, usually it composes of a title along with accompanying flavor text and the puzzle contents themselves. So I've brought up an example here. Uh, this was from a hunt that happened a few years back. The hunt itself was called Puzzle Potluck 2. So that's the title of the hunt. Uh, restaurant here is the title, and usually the title is not going to be super helpful, uh, but will give kind of a hint at the theme of the puzzle. Uh, so in this case, you know, a lot of it is restaurant themed. Perhaps the answer will have something to do with like a restaurant theme, um, but that's just kind of a little bit of a hint there. The more important line is the flavor text. This is usually one to two lines that will give more of an explicit hint in the right direction of what you are looking to do in the puzzle or what one of the mechanisms might be. So in this case, Professor Layton was getting hungry for a sandwich is likely gonna provide us some clue to help us break into the puzzle. And then the rest of it is gonna be referred to as the puzzle contents. This can be almost anything. Uh, in this case, we have a group of 10 lines of text that look something like crossword clues. That's a fairly common format of a puzzle, uh, but it could also just be like 10 random images or 10 random voice files or something like that. Um, really, people get creative and make a puzzle out of almost anything, so harder to predict what that's going to look like. Um, but let's go ahead and talk about how we might approach a puzzle like this. So the first step is almost always going to be identifying a data set. Um, so in this case, it's a little bit um, 
obvious maybe where to start. We have 10 crossword looking clues. So let's try to solve some of them. And another important thing to note in a puzzle hunt is that you are encouraged to use almost any tool at your disposal to help you solve it. Um, so unlike when we're doing a crossword together on down for a cross or something like that, um, the puzzles are designed to be so difficult that you are meant to use tools on the internet. Uh, one tool that we might use for a puzzle like this is a crossword solver. There's a lot of these online. Wordplays.com is my favorite, and I think we have that linked in the puzzle resources section uh, of our Discord. You can just put in a clue, and it will give you a list of some of the most common crossword solutions uh, that might be given for that clue. So if we went to that website and put in some of these uh, clue phrases, a lot of them are a little bit ambiguous or might not give great results, but we do start to get a few uh, that look kind of obvious. So I've put those on the screen here. A spicy dance is probably a salsa. The wise Egyptian god is probably Thoth, and the Winnebago seat is probably Oshkosh. So does anyone notice anything about those answers that might help us kind of find a pattern, keeping in mind that the flavor text referenced a sandwich? Yeah, very good. Uh, there are a substring of letters that are repeated in each of these answers. Uh, so I've kind of marked that off to the side here to help you see that. Um, they are making a sandwich between a letter and the word. Um, so in salsa, you know, we have this SA substring surrounding the letter L, uh, this TH substring surrounding the letter O, and this OSH substring surrounding the letter K. And that is an important observation because after you identify a data set, the next step in a puzzle is going to be finding a way to extract a letter from each item of the data set. And this can be done in a variety of different ways. We'll go over some of the most common ones, but in this case, fairly obvious that there is kind of this one important letter that is appearing in each item of our data set. And this observation also helps because it will help us fill in some of these uh, more ambiguous or less obvious clues now that we know what we might be looking for. And in fact, uh, with that observation, we are able to fill out this entire list and find a uh, word that will work with this pattern that we've identified for every single item. And that would move us on to the final step of the puzzle, which is simply finding an answer. Uh, sometimes it would be required to reorder the data set to get our answer out of it. For instance, if this was a list of films, we might have to put them in order of release date from the earliest to the latest, and then we'd be able to read our answer. Um, but in this case, you can see if you just read from top to bottom and take out that letter that we've extracted from each item, it spells the word pooled pork. So that would be an example of how to get an answer. And if we submitted that in our answer checker, it would very likely be the correct answer. And in this case it is. Uh, so that would allow us to solve this puzzle. Any questions on that before we move on? I'll give you guys a few seconds to look at that. All right. Uh, so. The next thing I want to go over is some of the common types of extraction uh, mechanisms you will come across in a puzzle hunt. So one of the most common ones that is used quite frequently uh, is indexing. Uh, this is finding a specific uh, position of a letter in the word. So for instance, maybe we had something like this. Uh, with some blanks at the beginning, and then the uh, clue phrases, geese laying, ladies dancing, and swans uh, swimming. Uh, does anyone recognize those from anywhere?
Definitely not. Yeah. Uh, never heard of it in my life. Not the most overplayed Christmas song ever. Uh, but these are just the 12 days of Christmas. And the blanks there will help us find the number of each of those things in the song. Um, so if you Google that, you know, you can find that there are six geese laying, nine ladies dancing, and seven swans are swimming. And that might clue you that the important letter you're trying to extract from uh, this data set is the letter in that position. Uh, so if we look here, the sixth letter of Gisa Lang is an A, the ninth letter of Ladies Dancing is an N, and the seventh letter of Swans of Swimming is an S. Uh, and I'll just go ahead and put those to the side. That is usually a pretty good start to uh, an answer, which we will uh, soon find out why that is. Um, but yeah, I'll just go ahead and put those over to the side. So that's indexing. And that is pretty frequent. You'll find that there's a way to both clue the data set that you're trying to collect, but also a number for each item of the data set. And then you'll just take the letter in that position. Um, another more common and bit easier to interpret one is just to read down the first letters of a data set. So for instance, in this case, we have some biblical uh, crossword clue type things going on here with the uh, enumerations there at the end, the number of letters that are going to be in your answer. Uh, so with those enumerations, it becomes pretty obvious that we're talking about the wise men, Eden, and the Red Sea here. And in this case, we don't have a lot of other information at our disposal. Um, so we might just try reading down the first letters of our data set and seeing if it spells anything. And in this case, if we put those letters off to the side, we can see that it is spelling the word answer here uh, at the beginning of our uh, solution. And that is usually a good sign. Uh, very often, uh, the designers will put something like that where it'll spell answer is or answer or something like that. Uh, hello, Lamia, welcome in. Uh, we are just going over um, something uh, we are recording this, so you'll be able to watch it back from the beginning at some point in the future. Um, but uh, we'll just keep going along for now. So, uh, yes, as I was saying, designers will often put answer is or something like that into the beginning of a solution so that you know you're on the right track. Uh, so in this case, I would be pretty satisfied saying, yeah, it's probably just the first letters of these words that we are trying to extract. Another more common and a bit more difficult um, way to extract the letter is with overlapping words. And to give an idea of what I mean with that, let's say that we had these three crossword clue uh, phrases, and there was a word highlighted at the beginning, wasted mixer and ever. And again, the uh, final number in parentheses there is the enumeration of the answer we are looking for. Um, so keeping in mind that we are looking to basically create a data set of three answers here, can anyone think of an answer to any of these questions? We have wasted time when friend was late with wasted highlighted at the beginning, mixer at work lame, boss refused to spend money with mixer highlighted, and ever a fan of non-odd numbers with ever highlighted. Can anyone think of an answer to any of those phrases uh, that might help reveal a pattern that we have going on here? Yes. Miser, even. Can anyone see the first one there? It's definitely the trickiest one. Waited. Very good, Jared. So uh, what's going on here is that the uh, highlighted word uh, was a clue towards the answer and that only one letter has been changed in each one to find a word that would fit the clue being described. And if we ended up with this data set, uh, again, there's not an obvious way to extract a letter, but it becomes obvious when you realize that they overlap with those highlighted words and only one letter has been changed in each one. Uh, so this is 
a bit more of an advanced extraction method, you know, it's going to be harder to get into things like this, but just wanted to give you an example of a way in which you can find uh, a more advanced way to extract a letter. And we'll go ahead and put those off to the side as well. Um, and it's spelling out answer is. So again, we are on the right track here uh, to find an answer. And then finally, we have some uh, common encoding methods, Morse code, Braille, semaphore, puzzle hunts love using these kinds of codes to uh, code an answer. So if you ever end up with something that looks like it might be able to be interpreted in one of those ways, uh, it's quite possible that you will need to interpret it in one of those ways to get your letters. So say we had a puzzle uh, where we ended up with just these four times. And you're thinking, how could you possibly get a letter out of a time? Uh, well, in this case, we might need to reinterpret this in some other way. Uh, and I'm thinking times, you know, maybe someone on the team is like, well, let's think about them as like faces on a clock. So if we interpret those, we would have something like this. And uh, I don't know how much any of you guys have done some kind of like encoding method type stuff. Um, I know Jared will probably know. Does anyone maybe see a way to interpret those as letters uh, in a common encoding method? All right, I will just give this one to you. Um, <laughs> yes, Jared, do you want to go ahead and say it? Let's hear it. What is the code? Semaphore, yes. So for those who don't know, semaphore is a code that takes the positions of flags around a person's body and uh, translates those to letters of the alphabet. If you want to Google semaphore, you can see a full list. I have included the most uh, the ones that are going to be helpful for us here. But you can see that the hands of the clock at 7.30 are identical to the hands of the semaphore figurine uh, representing the letter A. For 4.37, we have the hands of the clock uh, mirroring the hands of the letter N. And for 10.15, we have the hands of the clock mirroring the letter Y. So whenever you have kind of uh, something like this, and it'll definitely become uh, second nature the more that you see it, you know, anything that might reference like dots and dashes or short and long is probably going to be Morse code. If you see something that is like six uh, dots in kind of a grid like shape, it's probably going to be Braille, that kind of thing. Uh, so that's just something to become aware of and uh, think about if you're ever stuck on an extraction. Uh, but yeah, in this case, we're just wanting to interpret those as hands on a clock and then use semaphore to uh, translate the English letters that we need from it. So if we go ahead and put those over in the next column, we can read out that the answer is nanny. Um, those are probably the most common three. I think there might be some others in, yes, uh, AZ-126. That's where it's just simply the number uh, is of the letter in the alphabet is the, the letter that you want. So a three represents a C and so on and so forth. The puzzle resources channel has more of those listed. Um, and uh, there's also something called um, puzzled pint, which is this thing that is held in bars uh, across the world where they gather around and solve puzzles for an hour every month. Um, and they have a code sheet. So if you want to Google like uh, puzzled pint code sheet, uh, that can be very helpful for introducing you to some of those common ones. That might be in puzzle resources. If not, I'll put it in afterwards because it's a good resource on uh, some of those common encoding methods. So yeah, great question. And uh, we'll make sure that that gets put in. Any other questions before we move on to the next slide? All right. So uh, that is feeder puzzles and some common extraction tropes. Uh, I want to touch briefly on what a meta puzzle is and how to approach it. 
Uh, these are definitely harder and uh, more complicated, so we are not going to spend you know as much time on them. But it is a good thing just to kind of talk about. Um, so this is uh, kind of a quick example I've created of what a meta puzzle might look like. As you can see, there's a lot less information here than there is in a feeder puzzle, um, and that is because the data set that you're going to be relying on is the answers to all of the feeder puzzles you've done leading up to it. So what is the meta puzzle? It's a typically more difficult puzzle at the end of each round. Uh, like I just mentioned, instead of having their own data set, they require the answers from the previous feeder puzzles in order to solve them. Usually they're unlocked when about 75% of the feeder puzzles have been solved. So you don't have to solve every feeder puzzle before you get access to the meta. Uh, and solving it will allow you to progress to the next round. So as soon as it does get unlocked, it's usually a good idea to take a look and see if um, you can see any patterns emerging from your answers or something like that, because this is uh, how you progress in the hunt. This is the most important part. And while you do not need to solve every feeder puzzle, you do need to solve every meta puzzle. Yes, uh, the question from ethics is unlocked. Is there mechanisms in puzzle hunts to lock puzzles where you can't access them? The answer is yes. Um, usually you would start the hunt with one or two puzzles unlocked. And as you solve them, usually just on the website, there will be links to those puzzles. And then uh, as you solve them, a new link will reveal itself and you'll be able to uh, move on to the next puzzle. So meta puzzles are gated behind uh, feeders and uh, the next round is gated behind solving the meta. So that is how that works. So touching briefly on how to approach a meta puzzle, well, the first uh, thing to do is simply to collect your answers and list them out somewhere. Um, so in the last couple of slides, we got the answers pulled pork and nanny. I have filled in some other answers here. Let's say this was a uh, round with seven feeder puzzles, and we've gotten the answers fitting, waterlogged, queens, shiitake, but we are still missing one. Um, but as I said, that would be enough to unlock the meta, and we could start looking at it and seeing if we can uh, start to work on it. So this is not going to be true for every meta, but a good place to start with some is to find a way to fit them into the puzzle's format somehow. So in this puzzle, we, we don't have a lot of information. We just have this brick wall um, and some things. Yes, very good. Uh, Nightmerp, fit them into the bricks is exactly what you're gonna wanna do here. So some things that you might notice is that there are seven rows of bricks, just like we have seven answers and that each row of bricks has a different number of bricks in it. So you are physically and literally able to fit these answers into the brick wall as you have suggested. Um, so each of our answers has a different number of letters, and if we you know, looked at it as a crossword grid and just wrote them across, we would get the answers in this order uh, instead of you know, the random order that we had solved them in. So that is usually a good first step is can we fit these answers into the puzzle somehow, give us an order, something like that to look at. Uh, and then again, this is not gonna be the case with every meta puzzle, but just like in our feeder puzzles, now maybe there is something that the answers have in common that will allow us to extract letters from them. So does anyone see any, anything in common here? Uh, that might allow us to extract a letter, and I'll give you a hint that terribly messy wall is a bit of a hint towards that. Yes, you are correct. It's double letters, and it just hints towards it because those three words also have double letters in them. So there's a lot of double letters going on here. Um, but yeah, each of these answers 
has a double letter in it. Um, and like I said, looking for something that the answers have in common might lead you to a realization like that that helps you to solve the puzzle. So this was a pretty, um, pretty uh, simple take on a meta puzzle. Usually they're a lot more complicated than this. But yeah, just finding a way to fit them in to the puzzle format, finding something they have in common will help us lead to an answer. And I want to mention another resource here, Nutramatic.org. This is also linked in the puzzle resources section. Uh, it's a great resource uh, for kind of playing with words. It, it does anagrams, things like that. But it also, if you type in the letters you have and just put an underline uh, in places that you're missing them, will come up with a full list of uh, words or phrases that it thinks it is most likely to be. Uh, so a good tool to play around with there. But if we put in what we have with our missing letter, uh, it pretty much only comes up with the result lighten. And we could uh, just assume that that would be the answer to our puzzle and submit it. Um, and in this case, that would be it. So that's an example as well of how we could solve a meta puzzle even without having all of the feeder answers, just because we're able to kind of see what to do and make observations that lead us to getting enough of the answer uh, to solve it. And then going even a step further, um, this could allow us to then back solve those feeder puzzles that we have not yet solved. So in this case, let's say we get to the answer lights and we submit it on the page, it is correct. Now we know that this missing answer has to be nine letters long and it has to have an H in it. Uh, so then we could you know, go back to the puzzle. Maybe we have a couple other letters or we have something about the theme or something um, that would make it easy for us with those added constraints to solve that and never even have to think about the puzzle mechanism from a forward solve perspective, uh, but rather back solving it from the meta to the feeder. So that's also a little more advanced. We won't have to be doing a ton of that early on in the hunts, but just something I wanted to mention. Uh, so any questions about meta puzzles? All right, uh, just gonna wrap things up here since we're coming up on the half hour mark. But the last thing I wanted to talk about uh, a little bit was how we organize during a hunt. So uh, not all of you will be able to see this right now because I rule gated them to people that have signed up for the mini hunt, but in every uh, puzzle hunt in that current hunt section, we're gonna have two channels, a threads channel and a discussion channel. The discussion channel, uh, anyone can talk in and that's just for saying things like, you know, super hype for the hunt, that kind of thing, but also during the hunt saying, hey, I'm working on this puzzle and could use some help if anyone wants to take a look or I'm gonna grab lunch, but I'll be back in an hour, you know, just kind of uh, general discussion topics about the hunt during the hunt. Um, and then the threads channel uh, is our organized way of separating out each puzzle from itself. So I've just included a screenshot here of the last hunt we did together. The first three hunts, uh, the first three puzzles in the hunt were called Clouds, RT Poetry, and Opposites Attract. So we create a thread for each one of those. And uh, if you are working on the puzzle, if you wanna say anything about it, make an observation or something, uh, if you just say it in the thread, those are open and we can keep all of the puzzle solving in one place. So that if someone wants to come and see like, hey, uh, what is all the work that's been done on clouds? They can come and easily see that. Now, a quick note about threads. This is also kind of a stupid Discord UI thing that I'm not a huge fan of. Uh, but you won't receive notifications unless you click into the thread. So if you are actively working on a hunt and you want a notification for every puzzle, I would recommend as soon as you see this uh, thread created message pop up in the threads channel, to just click on it, and then that'll be enough for you to get notifications in the future. Um, or, you know, if you'd rather not be working on every puzzle, but you only want to see the one or two puzzles that look interesting to you, you can also use that to kind of control how you get notified by clicking into just the puzzles that uh, you are interested in. Uh, and then along with our threads channel, we also have a master spreadsheet for every uh, hunt. 
and uh, we'll have an overview tab where we list out you know each of the puzzles we've unlocked. As we get answers, we'll put those into the answer column. There's a progress bar where you can you know mark when a puzzle's been solved and everyone knows. And then across the bottom of the spreadsheet, we will have a tab for every puzzle. And spreadsheets are a great way to actively work on a puzzle. You know, if you have a list of crossword clues you're trying to solve, everyone can just kind of type type it in one place and it's it's organized and then easy to kind of look at the data and analyze it. Um, so we always have a spreadsheet for the hunt and this will be linked at the top of the threads channel. Now for those participating in the mini hunt, uh, we've actually gone ahead and pre-prepared spreadsheets for you to work on the puzzles. So there's not gonna be a master spreadsheet, um, but this is how we would normally organize in a hunt. Okay, good note um, here that you have to right click and join the thread. Uh, so just make sure that you do that if you're interested in uh, being in the thread, make sure you right click and press join thread. It's pretty annoying that Discord does it in my opinion. We are considering ways around it. It does actually allow you to ping into a thread. So in the future, we might have a special role where if you want to be auto joined into every thread, uh, you can join that role and we will use it to auto join people into the threads. But uh, yeah, just a note, something that Discord does that we're gonna have to work around for now. Uh, but yeah, that's that's how we organize. So you'll use the Discord just for discussing the puzzle, that kind of thing, and the spreadsheet for actively working on them. Uh, so that's the end of my presentation. Does anyone have any questions on any of that before we move on to this little mini hunt experience that we have set up? Uh, and also a note on that, if you are wanting to participate in the mini hunt, which will start right after this, um, you will need a special role for it. So if you are planning to participate, make sure that you can see this Grand Mini 23 and Grand Mini 23 discussion channel um, on the uh, Discord. If you cannot see it but would like to participate, let me know, and I will go ahead and add that role for you so you can see it. And the reason we've done that is so that people who wanted to participate in the future but are not available today uh, won't have any spoilers. So also with that, if you are interested in participating in the future, make sure you head over to the Grand Mini 23 signups channel and press that uh, uh, silver metal react button. Um, we're planning to do another run of this next weekend. So we will just make sure that uh, you are able to do it then. Yes, the slideshow itself, as well as the video of this presentation will be available uh, probably after we get through this mini hunt, we will make that available. So uh, be on the lookout for that if you weren't able to catch the whole thing and uh, it'll, it'll all be there for you. All right, well, I will go ahead and end this presentation now. For those that are moving on to the mini hunt, I'm about to post a message there. I think there are six uh, or seven of you working on it. So it can be uh, kind of a thing that you guys just work through at whatever pace you guys would like, um, but we'll head on over there and provide more information. So we'll see you all there shortly. And thanks everyone for tuning in.